We showed that for implicit method, the solution is implicit in the final equation, which needs a solving process. For explicit method on the other side, the solution is directly obtained. You might think that since the implicit method is using the slope from the unknown step and the result needs to be solved, it should be considered as a more accurate time integration method. This is actually not true. Implicit integration is not necessarily more accurate than explicit. The benefits of the implicit method is the stability. No matter how large the time step you choose for implicit method, instability will not occur for the results. Instability happens when the rounding errors are magnified. You will find the analysis results become unbounded, leading to an explosive kind of a numerical instability. On the other side, explicit method does not have the stability merit. In fact, because of this, explicit methods are required to use very small time step size. How to choose time step size for explicit method is a critical question. We will discuss this in a bit. So far, you might consider implicit method as an ideal method using correct derivatives in time stepping and has stability advantages. However, the biggest issue of implicit method is its high requirement of computational cost. This puts limits on how small the time step size can be used. The 1D ODE we solved in the previous lesson is overly simple. In research and engineering, the ODEs are much more complicated and in many cases are highly nonlinear. To solve a nonlinear mechanical problem by implicit method, we need to go through Newton iteration in each time steps so that to find the converged solution. For a large-scale, highly nonlinear problem, this process could be painful. So it's not realistic for implicit method to have extremely small time step size. The analysis might keep going for days or months or just fail due to lack of computational power. On the other side, explicit has no such trouble. No iteration is needed inside one time step. It can use very small time step because of its simplicity, so it can find much more intermediate results, which is preferred in consideration of accuracy. To sum up, we cannot directly compare the accuracy of the two methods. Each of them has its advantage and disadvantage, and they should be used in different applications. The guideline to choose between implicit and explicit is for slow movement, long duration analysis, or even quasi-static analysis, implicit method is preferred. For example, material creep analysis, gear intermission, robot arm, etc. For fast movement, short duration, highly nonlinear, especially impact involved problems, explicit method is recommended. For example, drop test, car crash, bullet impact, etc. We mentioned that explicit method may suffer a stability issue if the time step size is not small enough. So how should we configure the right time step size? To enforce stable results, the time step size is limited so that in a single time step, a stress wave cannot travel further than the smallest element characteristic stance. This is called current Frederick's Louis condition. The definition might sound complicated to you, but actually it can be very concisely expressed by math language. First of all, let's use edge to represent the characteristic length of a finite element. You can consider edge as a kind of average dimension of an element. Then we use C to represent the wave speed in the material. The value of C depends on what kind of material we are simulating. Now the ratio between H and C becomes the time the wave passing one element. Let's find the minimum of such ratio for all the elements of one simulation and times this ratio with a safety factor F. Usually F is a value equal or smaller than one. So the time step used in an explicit analysis should be smaller than this value. Note that it's the minimum characteristic length controlling the time step size in explicit analysis. Therefore, we should try to have element size as uniform as possible in one simulation, because we don't want to reduce time step size just because of one or several extremely small elements. As for the wave speed, when the material's wave speed is not available, we can use Young's modulus and density to make an approximation. 
there are transverse waves and longitudinal waves in material. Longitudinal wave moves faster than the transverse wave. Therefore, time step size is controlled by longitudinal wave speed. Longitudinal elastic wave can be calculated by Young's modulus and density. You can see that the larger the Young's modulus or the smaller the density is, the larger the wave speed is and the smaller the time step size should be used. Let's try find an appropriate time step size for a problem. Given the material and analysis information, Young's modulus E, density rho, and characteristic element size h, the allowable time step size is calculated to be 3.96 e minus 7 second. If the total analysis time is 2 seconds, the number of time steps required for this analysis is at least 5 times 10 to the power of 6. If the total analysis time is 20 seconds, then 10 times of the calculated number of time steps is needed. So people start to wonder, in real analysis, is there a way to numerically increase time step size so as to expedite the analysis? The way to do this is called mass scaling. Mass scaling is a method in simulation to reduce runtime for large-scale explicit analysis. Based on the formulation to calculate material wave velocity and time step size, the larger the material's mass is, the larger the required time step can be. By mass scaling, the mass of those smallest elements of a model are scaled to be larger, so that the time step size used for the analysis can be increased. Note that it's a group of smallest element, not all the elements of the model. Since only a small portion of the elements are subject to mass scaling, the global accuracy of the analysis can be remained in acceptable range. After talking so much about these time step methods, I'm craving for a can of soda. Now, let's do a little simulation on this empty can. We will solve a can crush problem by explicit dynamics and use mass scaling. Originally, the critical time step for the can crash problem is 1 e minus 7 seconds based on the material and element size I choose. Which means that if using time step larger than this value, the solution will be unstable. Now, if we want to solve the analysis by twice of the original time step size, that is 2 e minus 7 seconds, we can apply mass scaling to the structure so that the mass of the smallest element are manually increased. You should always check how many elements are affected by mass scaling. If all the elements are scaled by a large number, the accuracy of the analysis are mostly lost. Here's the mass scaling factor counterplot for the can crush problem. In this case, you can see that very less elements are affected by mass scaling. And the scale number is reasonable. The largest value is about four times of the original density and the results from the mass scaling are very close to the original results. One thing to remember is that mass scaling cannot be abused to drastically increase the time step size of the explicit because global mass change will cause erroneous analysis results. For long duration analysis, if it requires too many time steps for explicit method, you might consider switching it to implicit method.